All right, welcome to another Bible study. I am going to finish the Iron Kingdom series, and I'm, right now I'm working on King David of Israel. Now, King David was a very interesting subject of the Bible. He ruled Israel. He had his faults and shortcomings, but the Bible declares that he was a man after God's own heart. Because when he was confronted of his shortcomings and things of evil that he did, he recognized them, repented, and got right with the Lord. And not only that, I mean, let's face it, Christ was... Well, the Bible declares that he was the root and offspring of David. So Christ created the line from which David came from, and yet he was born of that same line. And uh, figure that one out, right? Now we read in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and verse 14, uh, speaking to King Saul, uh, Saul started off as a really pretty decent king. He really did. But, uh, and he, I believe he was of the tribe of Benjamin. But later in life, he fell away and uh, he even consulted the witch in Endor. Isn't it funny that in uh, Bewitched, the TV series, the uh, mother of Samantha, if you remember that garbage. Her name was Endora. Hmm. I wonder if they got that from the Bible. Endor and Endora. Of course they did. People that do the TV, you know, they're well steeped in the occult stuff. They know. All right. I, uh, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. The Lord speaking to King Saul. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So, is there a New Testament witness to this? Oh yeah. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, God removing Samuel, I mean uh, Saul, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Was David perfect? Oh, absolutely not. Now, in Psalms 89, verse 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. You know, one of the things I wonder when it says he's going to build up his throne to all generations and he's going to you know thy seed will i establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations does it just mean that you know christ was of the seed of david does that mean that christ was the final king of david that's forever or are there, is there actually 
someone related to King David that's actually sitting on a throne somewhere in the world today. Now, I'm not saying I believe this, but I've heard it said that the uh, royal family of England could trace their lineage back to King David. I don't know if it's true, but uh, I'm sure they got corrupted the seed line in there somewhere. You never know. I don't know. Just something to think about. But I do know Christ is of the royal line of David, the king. Now, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, they're, you know, they're looking for somebody to open the scroll to read it, right? He goes, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So, the lion of the tribe of Judah is the root of David. Now, we read in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, I, Jesus, this is Christ speaking, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So, not only did Christ create everything, Adam, but he was the root of David. He was the creator of Adam, from which they all sprang. But he's also the offspring, the son of David. You know, the virgin birth. I've got a lot of studies on that kind of stuff. I don't want to get into that here. But uh, the virgin birth is a very, very important doctrine. I mean, let's face it. Original sin. So, if you're interested, you can go to the search bar on my channel and look up virgin. And I think it's Isaiah 7 and verse 14, if memory serves me correctly. All right, so let's get going here. Psalms 132 and verse 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body. Children, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Okay? Let's take a look at Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Speaking of David and Christ, okay? Speaking of Christ, but, you know, through David. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. This is the millennial reign and, well, after the, uh, well, it, after the, um, after the millennium, Satan's loosed for a little while and then he's cast into the lake of fire. Well, after that happens, this is going to be fulfilled. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 16, and verse 5. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. All right, 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The Rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Boy, I wish we had that in Washington today, huh? Verse 4, and he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a, a morning without clouds, 
as the tender grass springeth, springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. See, God made an everlasting covenant with David. Yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure. For this is all my salvation and my desire, although he make it not to grow. Now, the everlasting covenant that God made with David, that's why when Israel and Judah, two separate houses, when Israel went into apostasy, God divorced Israel. But he didn't divorce Judah. There was a reason for that. God's covenant with David. Matter of fact, uh, let's take a look at that. So, you know, that's the thing. God keeps his covenants. All right, let's take a look. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. Now, King Josiah was, I believe, the last good king of Judah. Josiah was a great king. But the people had gone almost so far into wickedness, the Lord had just about ready to uh, shut the door on them, so to speak. The Babylonians were getting ready to come and take them away. Just like the Assyrians had taken Israel away into captivity. Jeremiah is a book of rebuke from the Lord for the people's sins. So let's read Jeremiah 3 and verse 6. The Lord also said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Okay, Israel and Judah were two separate kingdoms at this time. Okay, just like in the days of the Civil War, the United States, you had the North and the South. Well, this is what you had in Israel. You had Israel and you had Judah. Israel to the North, Judah to the South. Hast thou seen what backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Yeah, they were going up on the mountains and under the trees, and they were practicing witchcraft and Satanism. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. See, God says that Israel has a treacherous sister named Judah. Oh yeah, I know the preachers just love to say, well, Judah and Israel is the same. Well, no, they're not. Israel and Judah had wars against each other. They had different kings, different land areas. They're not the same. Let's read verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced Israel. Let's read on. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also. You see, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. Why? Because of the everlasting covenant that God had made with David. Now, this Bible study is going to be on why did Absalom, the son of King David, try to kill his father? But... I'm trying to do some, build up some background for you. All right, turn to 2 Samuel 12 and verse 1. Now, David had uh, become king. And if you don't know the story of Bathsheba, well, you know, you're doing yourself a big disfavor by not reading the entire Bible. And if you don't like reading, you know, there's a guy named Alexander Scorby, S-C-O-U-R-B-Y, 
and he reads the entire King James Bible. He was, from what I understand, he was a Shakespearean actor. He has uh, a very good reading voice. And uh, as far as I know, it's really good. I mean, it's, it's great. I've owned several copies of it. Uh, they sell it on CD. You can get the New Testament on CD for like, I don't know, 20-something dollars. You can get the entire Bible for right around 85 to $100. Um, you know, you can listen to the entire Bible. Uh, they make it in CD. And all you got to do is pop it in your CD player on your way to work or whatever and listen to the Bible each day. You'll learn a lot if you don't like reading. I've listened to the Bible. I've read it. Um, but the deal is... Uh, there was a woman that lived, well, a woman and her husband that lived next to the king's palace. And let me tell you something. You don't live next door to the king's palace if you're not somebody important, okay? And he was a an important person in David's army. Well, David's up looking out either from the roof or the palace window or something, and he sees this gorgeous woman on her roof taking a bath, okay? You know, that in itself is kind of strange. I mean, you know, what's a woman doing on the roof taking a bath, right? Right in the view of the king's palace. And, uh, you know, it kind of makes you wonder. Now, David already had uh, at least two wives that I know of. He had um, Nabal's wife, I think her name was Abigail, and then he had Saul's daughter, but uh, she had been, Saul had given her to another man, so maybe she was defiled and David didn't touch her anymore. I, I'm not sure how, that's uh, getting into the Old Testament law, and the Bible's kind of silent on that issue, so I don't know if he was... Well, all I know is he had, I believe it was Abigail, as a wife, okay? He had at least one wife that he was having relations with. So here it is, he's checking out Bathsheba, uh, Uriah's wife. And I will guarantee you, she was gorgeous, okay? I mean, when a man's got a wife and, and he's checking out another guy's wife, Usually she's very nice looking. So what does he do? He uh, has this woman come over. He knows her, if you know what I'm saying. Has relations with her. She gets pregnant. And then he conspires with his, gen uh, his army people to make sure that this woman's husband gets killed in battle. He basically has him murdered, okay? I mean, and this guy's a faithful servant of David, okay? I mean, so this is uh, what the Lord has to say about this. Turn to 2 Samuel 12 and verse 1. And I'm going somewhere with all this. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. You know, Nathan was a prophet. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and his, and his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. In other words, the rich man had a, a whole flock, but he didn't want to take of his flock, so he took the poor man's only lamb, killed it, prepared it, for this, his, this traveler, his guest, okay? The rich man didn't want to take of his own flock. 
He wanted to take from the poor man that had almost just one thing, left him with nothing, right? So, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to David, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You're the one, David. You did this. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of, and of Jacob. And if that had been too little, I would more, moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, now, therefore the sword, or war, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil, evil against thee out of thine own, own, I'm sorry, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. That is a prophecy that we're going to be reading about real soon. The Lord's going to raise up evil out of David's own house. His own children. Think Absalom, people. Verse 12. For thou didst this, did it, didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. So what did David do? And David said unto Nathan, These are the words that the Lord loves to hear more than anything else out of our mouth, or one of the things he loves to hear more than anything else out of our mouth. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So the child that David had impregnated Bathsheba with dies. All right, so let's go reading about um, Absalom. See, the Lord had pronounced that he's going to have trouble from his, his own household. Now, think about this. David had multiple wives and children by these multiple wives. And, you know, a lot of guys, I've said it before, but, you know, a lot of guys think, wow, wouldn't it be great to have a whole bunch of different wives? You know, like if you have seven wives, you can have a different one each night of the week. Wouldn't that be great? Well, would it? And then you got all these sons by these different wives growing up, arguing and fighting against each other because they want to be, I mean, you know, David's the king. So you got all these different sons from all these different wives. Each one probably thinks, I should be king. Well, no, I should be king. No, I should be king. No, I should be king because my mother was the first wife. Well, I should be king because my mother was the last wife. Or I should be king because my mother is the favorite of David's wives. And, 
they're all fighting and arguing with each other. And, and a lot of guys think, oh, it'd be great to have all these different wives, one for each day of the week, right? Wrong. There's going to be trouble out of David's own house. Nathan the prophet told David, this is a prophecy. It's coming, people. So let's read on. All right, so remember this. David had multiple wives, multiple sons, and multiple daughters by all these different, you know. He must have been really busy, if you know what I mean. All right, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 1. 13 is one of those numbers that pops up in the Bible. It's I've never seen it be a good... Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I... Normally, when you see a 13 in the Bible, it's usually seems like it's a, a bad type of thing. So, um, and it came to pass after this that Absalom, now remember, Absalom is the son that tried to kill David. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now, they're probably half-brothers and half-sisters. I didn't trace, chase, trace down the genealogy, so I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't think they had the same mother, but they had the same father. Now, remember this. After, in the book of, I think it's Leviticus or Deuteronomy, in the law, the Torah, as the Hebrew roots people love to say, there is a list of people who you cannot marry. Okay? So, you know, brothers and sisters, when they were considered close relations, they were forbidden to marry each other. And, you know, we didn't find out until oh, probably the last hundred years, why that was. See, when you marry people with the same genetic background and makeup, it seems like the bad parts of the genetic makeup are more pronounced. So, for example, the Russian royal family had hemophilia. Uh, in their family. And if you don't know what hemophilia is, it's uh, a blood disorder. The blood doesn't clot. So when you get a minor cut, you're in danger of bleeding to death. So they had, um, they called, well, you know, it was incest. That's why, one of the reasons why the states required a marriage license. They wanted to re uh, see if you were related to each other. But another thing, too, is back before the so-called Civil Rights Act of 1964 under Lyndon Bain Johnson, uh, it was to prevent interracial marriage. There was a lot of states that per, uh, interracial marriage was actually illegal. Now, were they a bunch of racists, or did they know Bible stuff that we don't know now? Of course, that was before, back before abortion was legal, what can I tell you? So, um, so first of all, for Ab, uh, Amnon and Tamar to get married would have not been allowed under the Torah, the law, okay? Because they were related. They were too closely related, right? All right, so... And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister. And that word fair, um, remember Snow White, the wicked queen? Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? They're not talking about when you're playing poker with your friends and you're not, you're not cheating. To be fair is a racial description. Okay, and having a fair complexion doesn't apply to the natives of Africa, if you know what I'm saying. 
if you want to see what people that are fair complected uh, well, it used to be you could go to Scandinavia, you know, Sweden, Denmark, blonde hair, blue eyes. They would have fair complexions. But uh, that's not true anymore since they're flooding the land with um, all these uh, Muslims. So, All right, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So when they says she was a fair, you know, she's probably beautiful, right? And his, they, um, Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. To her. So here it is, Amnon wanted his sister half-sister, probably. But he thought it was hard to, you know, do anything to hurt her or whatever, right? Verse 3, But Amnon had a friend. Oh, yeah. The devil will always send you a friend. And Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei. Shimei? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. David's brother. So, one of David's brothers had a son that was friends with uh, Amnon. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. What does it mean to be subtle? Well, it has a whole lot of different shades of meaning to be subtle. Let's take a look. In the Strong's Concordance, it's Hebrew word 2450. Chakam, I think is how they pronounce it. I should have studied more Hebrew in the Bible College, but I didn't. Okay? But, where do we read this? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle... Ooh. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Subtle. The word subtle has many shades of meanings. Okay? It could mean, well, the, in the King James, they translate it as wise, wise man, cunning, a cunning man, subtle, unwise, or wiser. It could mean somebody that's shrewd, crafty, cunning, wily, subtle. You know, it could be wise in wickedness. You know, to be shrewd, crafty, cunning. So, it not doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing, but not necessarily a good thing either. So, so here it is. Amnon had a friend who was a very subtle man, okay? So let's look at the advice that he gave unto him. Verse 4. And he said unto him, you know, he's talking to Amnon that loves Tamar, this girl, right? His sister. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? In other words, you know, something's bothering you, but why don't you tell me? Maybe I can help you, you know, give you some good advice, you know? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Ooh, here's the punchline. And Jonadab said unto him, Oh, this is what you need to do, right here. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay down, I'm sorry, lay, lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick, 
And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick, and when the king was come to him, Amnon said unto the king, to David, right, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in thy sight that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. In other words, your brother's sick. Go make him some food and feed him, you know. Help him out. So Tamar, the fair, beautiful sister, right, who's a virgin. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was laid down, and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out, every man from him. So he, he's telling everybody, Leave, get out of here. I want some privacy. So everybody leaves, right? Verse 10. And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thy hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. The bedroom, right? And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come, Lie with me, my sister. Ooh. Lie with me, my sister. And he's not talking about just lying in the bed together. I, mean, I think you catch the drift. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me. No, don't. No, my brother, don't rape me, okay? Nay, my brother, do not force me. For no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not vow this folly. In other words, don't do this. Now, for those of you that don't know it, to do folly means to do something really stupid. All right, verse 13. Uh, you know, she doesn't want to get raped, so this is what she's saying. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? You know, she's going to be raped. You know, she's going to be ashamed, right? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. In other words, go talk to father. And if, you know, father says, he, he won't, you know, if you want to marry me, go talk to father. He'll let you marry me, you know. Um, verse 14. How be it he, Amnon, right? He would not hearken, he wouldn't listen. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. So she, uh, he raped her. Okay? Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. You know, basically, I'm done. With, uh, you know, I got what I wanted from you. I'm done. Get out of here. Okay? I mean, uh, what's, what is the reason for this? Was she not as responsive as he thought she should be? Did she say something that killed the mood? You know, the Bible's silent on this subject, but for some reason, he lost interest with her. Now, I'm not a big, I used to be a big Star Trek fan, but uh, I remember once, I'll make it short, um, in the episode of Mock Time, where the uh, Vulcans have to mate, the males or whatever, they're, the, the woman that they were betrothed to, you know, the espoused to, to be wife, to be wife, not officially married yet, they had the cho chance to uh, challenge the man that they were going to be married to. So Spock got to fight Kirk or whatever and because his uh, wife-to-be wanted to challenge 
him being wife to the husband. So she chooses another Vulcan guy, right? She didn't want to be married to Spock. So at the end of it all, she, um, Spock goes to her and basically, you know, it's an insult. You know, well, you don't want me for a husband. Well, fine, you know, it's an insult. So he says to the, um, the, the, the boyfriend, I guess you could say, of this woman that he was supposed to be married to, he said, well, she is yours. And he says to him, after a time, you may find that wanting, oh, I'm sorry, that, oh, I'm sorry, that after a time that having is not nearly so pleasing a thing as wanting. It is not logical, but it is often true. Maybe that's the case here. When he finally had her, he didn't want her anymore. You know, I don't know why. So, here it is, Amnon raped her. He hated her exceeding. And then he's telling her, get lost, verse 16. And she said unto him, there is no cause. This evil in sending me away is, is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. In other words, not only do you rape me, which was bad enough, but now what you're doing is he, sending me away is even worse than raping me. But he would not hearken unto her. Verse 17. Then he called a servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. In other words, kick her out and lock the door. I don't want her here. And she had a garment of divers colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins, apparelled. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment. She ripped it to pieces and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. So not only did he rape her, he, kicked, he boots her out after he's done with her. Now we're going to get to the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would have said. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Ooh. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? He knew what was going on. But now hold thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother's Absalom house. To remain desolate means she never got married and she never had children. How horrible is that? Amnon had not only defiled her, he had completely ruined her future. She was not a virgin. She would not have been a virgin on her wedding night. All right, now let's read verse 21. So Absalom, he took care of his sister as best as he could. Now, can you imagine Absalom going to King David, his father, and saying, do you know what your son did to my sister? Okay, so let's read verse 21. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. He was angry. Okay, he was mad. Now, in the law, in the book of Deuteronomy or Leviticus, when a woman was raped, there was two solutions. One, it was a capital crime. The punishment for rape in the Old Testament was death. Unless, of course... The, uh, if, the, if the woman and the parents all agreed 
the, the parents of the woman, if they all agreed, they could cause, have them be married. Okay? But the woman had to agree, they got raped, and, and the parents had to agree that, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's some leeway in the law. Suppose there was a, a man and a, a, a boy and a girl, and they both love each other. Well, and they were eventually going to be married. And one day he forced her before the wedding night. You know, he wanted to, he didn't want to wait. You know, and, and she loves him, and she doesn't want him killed, but yet he still raped her. You know, he could, um, he could be put to death, but she could say, no, my parents, don't kill him. What he did was wrong, but I'll marry him because I love him and he loves me. If everybody agreed, they got married. And do you know in the law, he couldn't divorce her because he had forced her? He could not divorce her. She, he had to keep her as a wife for the rest of his life, even if he didn't want her. And he had to provide for her. So, David was angry. What did he do? Did he put Amnon to death? No. Did he force Amnon to marry his sister? Uh, no. What did he do? Nothing. He was angry. That's it. Verse 22. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Ooh. So Absalom didn't say anything good or bad. But he hated Amnon because he had raped his sister. Okay? So... And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. So here it is, Absalom's going to have a feast, and he invited all the sons of the king, all his brothers from all these different wives. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shearers. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with my servant. And the king said, uh, said to Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all go, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. So, you know, here it is, he's saying, I want everybody to come for a, a feast. But David says, no, I can't go, I'm busy, you know, but, you know, everybody else can go, right? Then said, uh, verse 26, then said Absalom, if not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, why should he go with thee? But Absalom pressed him that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. Oh yeah, give him wine, let him get drunk. Mark ye now that when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, smite means to strike, to hit, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. Ooh. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's son, sons arose, and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. So here it is, Absalom kill, had Amnon killed. Okay? And then all their sons are like, yeah, like running, you know, they get on their mules or whatever, and they take off in every direction. You know? But they killed one of my brothers and front of me at the feast table, I'd be kind of to you. And it came to pass while they were in the way that, that tidings came to David, saying, Absalom hath slain all the king's sons. 
and there's not one of them left. Then the king rose and tear his garments and lay on the earth and all its servants died with their... Remember, Nathan the prophet said um, that uh, there would be trouble in David's house because of what he did with Bathsheba? Well, guess what? This is only the start. This is the introduction, people. Um, and Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Jonadab, isn't this the guy that told Amnon how to rape his sister Tamar? Oh yeah, it's the same guy. What's he doing here? He's the son of one of David's brothers. Now therefore, let not my lord the king take the, this, take the thing to his heart, to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. But Absalom fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there came much people by the way of the hill side behind him. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come, as thy servants said. So it is. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very sore. So they're crying for, you know, Amnon. Okay? But I hate to tell you this. Absalom was, was well within his rights to kill the guy that had raped his sister. Rape was a capital crime. He deserved to die according to the law. But of course, it should have been David that did it. David should have been the one that had him put to death. What did he do? Nothing. You know, and don't think that that didn't, Absalom didn't, you know, Absalom's probably looking, he probably lost a lot of respect for his father, David. For not doing what he thought was the right thing. Hey, this guy raped, this guy raped my sister, and you're just gonna let it pass like it's nothing, really? But Absalom fled, and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and there. And was there three years. And the soul of David, and the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. So not only did David lose Amnon, his son, now he lost his son Absalom because he's gone. You know, he fled. He he did the you know, he killed Amnon and now, instead of David just losing one son, he's lost both two sons, right? All right, so let's keep going. Now, think about this. Absalom's sister was raped. His father did absolute, absolutely nothing, except for get angry about it. You know, Absalom probably lost all the respect he had for his father. You know, so, uh, not that David was perfect. So, here it is, Absalom's gone for a couple years. All right, go to Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. Now, Joab, the son of Jezuriah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched there, uh, and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner, and put on now mourning apparel, and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that hath had that had a long time mourned for the dead. And come to the king and speak on this matter unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance 
and said, help, O king. Uh, when you do obeisance, it means you're, uh, you ever see somebody bowing to the ground? Okay, that's, that's doing obeisance. And the king say, said unto her, so David saying unto her, what aileth thee? And she answered, I am indeed, I am indeed a widowed woman, a widow woman, and mine husband is dead. And thy handmaid had two sons. And they too strove together in the field, and there was none to part them, but the one smote the other and slew him. And behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid, and they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him, for the life of his brother whom he slew. And we will destroy the heir also, and so they shall quench my coal which is left, and shall not leave to my husband, neither name nor remind, remainder upon the earth. So here it is. This woman is saying her husband's dead. She had two sons, and they fought. They were fighting together. There was nobody to separate them, and the one killed the other. But now the rest of the family wants to kill the last remaining son for the death of the other brother, right? So now this woman's going to have no husband and no sons. The whole family's gone. All right, so, so she's saying, and so they shall quench my coal which is left, and shall not leave to my husband neither name nor remainder upon the earth. And the king said unto the woman, Go to thine house, and I will give charge concerning thee. And the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, My lord, O king, the inquiry be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. And the king say, and the king said, Whatsoever saith aught unto thee, bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of thy son fall to the earth. Now remember, Absalom killed Amnon. Okay? Now, when Amnon kill, uh, raped Tamar, Absalom's sister, nobody did anything, right? But when Absalom carried out the law and killed Amnon for the rape, now you've got all these other brothers that are possibly going to try to kill Absalom for, for killing the guy that raped his sister. Think about that, okay? So that's what they're talking about, the revengers of blood, okay? Um, I'm sure maybe Amnon had other brothers that were mad at Absalom for killing their brother. I don't know. I haven't studied out the genealogy, so I, I'm just kind of guessing here. You know, just a thought. I'm not saying that is. So. Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer, or allow, not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of thy son fall to the earth. Then the woman said, let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word unto my lord the king. And he said, Say on. And the woman said, Wherefore then hast thou fought such a thing against the people of God? For the king doth speak this thing as one which is faulty, in that the king doth not fetch home again his banished. He's talking about Absalom. Absalom's banished, right? For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered up again neither doth god respect any person yet doth he devise means that his banished may not be expelled from him now therefore now therefore that i am come to speak of this thing unto my lord the king it is because the people have made me afraid and thy handmaid said I will now speak unto the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. For the king will hear to deliver his handmaid out of the hand of the man 
that would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God. Now thy, oh, I'm sorry. Then thine handmaid said, the word of my Lord the King shall now be comfortable, for as an angel of God, so is my Lord the King to discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God will be with thee. Then the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. And the woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from aught that my lord the king hath spoken. For thy servant Joab, he bade me, and he put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid. To fetch about this form of speech hath my servant Joab done this thing, and my Lord is wise, according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. In other words, go get my son. You know, he's been gone long enough. Why should I lose two sons? I've already lost the one. Why should I lose two, right? And Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, my lord, O king, and that the Lord, and that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. All right, now we're going to get to the meat. Wow, this has already been an hour. This is, um, I guess, I'm, maybe I'm going to make this a part one and a part two and uh, let's see yeah I think I'm going to stop right here so and make a part two because this is already an hour all right so I guess this is going to be part one and I'll start a part two because now we're getting to the point where Absalom's getting ready to rebel against his father, the king. He wanted to be king. And like I say, he probably lost all respect for his father, being that he didn't deal with Amnon for the rape of his sister. I don't know. All right, so this is uh, part one. And uh, in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. In Jesus' name, amen.